Okay, welcome back everybody. Hope you had a nice lunch. It was lovely actually. Thanks to Jackson's for feeding us all. Okay, it's been a great morning and now we're in for a real treat. What to say about this man really? I think he possibly and probably, as I said in air, should be running the country. But he's too busy looking after your football team. And I've been assured, not by him, but by everyone I've met today, that Sam is coming back this year. So no pressure. Um, It's typical of people who are incredibly successful, I find, in my life. The bigger they are, the nicer they are. Please give a really warm welcome to Jim McGuinness. Just the first thing I'm going to say is, from my own point of view, in a way, it's been absolutely unbelievable, the feel-good factor, since I've arrived this morning. And I think it's great that we're here for a very, very serious issue in many respects, but the positivity in the room is really, really encouraging. So that's the first thing I'd say. I'm going to get fly through this, because uh, there's a wee bit to get through, and um, maybe if there's any questions afterwards, we can, we can go through that. I'm going to stick that up for a second, you can read it, and then I'll elaborate. I actually thought about that myself when I was doing my junior cert art uh, exam. <laughs> what am I trying to say? What I'm trying to say more than anything really is, in my opinion anyway, every child is a blank canvas. I know sometimes people are born with a disability, but in general, in my opinion, every child is a blank canvas. And uh, I think that It's a very, very important thing in terms of what we're talking about today. We're talking about sport and how sport can facilitate mental health. And I think when we talk about that, we've obviously got to talk about the people that work with the kids and the people that work with uh, anybody that's involved in sport, so whether it's kids or adults. So in my opinion, um, every child is a blank canvas. Every single person in this room was a blank canvas and is moving through their life. And that's the next slide which is a beautiful slide, I think. It reminds me of my own daughter, who's the exact same age. And for me, that represents when you're born, you're a blank canvas, but also that every single one of us are on an individual journey. Every single person in this room is on an individual journey, as, I am, as am I. And uh, I think that's important. And again, really important in terms of working with other people and trying to build a mindset and a mentality that makes them be the best that they can be. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So the question is, how do you get from a blank canvas to a masterpiece? That's what you want. That's what I want for my children. I think that's what everybody wants from their children. That's what everybody wants in their life. You know, a really happy, positive life. That people have life satisfaction and they enjoy every minute that they're on this earth. Okay, And that's one of the big things in terms of using sport as a vehicle. How do we get that blank canvas? And that's what they are. That's what everybody is. Who? A masterpiece. Okay? These are some of the assumptions that were brought up uh, when I was contacted to do it. Some of the assumptions in terms of uh, sport and mental health. Um, the importance of sport and promoting mental health. The importance of children and young people being engaged in sport from a young age. How sport helps uh, develop friendships, camaraderie, teamwork, a sense of belonging, and being part of something special. Uh, how sport can teach children how to deal with disappointment, you know, not wanting a game, not coming first, playing their best, etc. I would question that on one level, to be honest with you. I think that they can do that, that sport can do that, no doubt. But I would question, does it do it? if you're driving the process instead of people enjoying the process? I would suggest maybe not. Um, In terms of belonging, sport can be fantastic to be a part of a group and to be a teammate and and that sense of belonging that comes with being a group. But if you create a situation for young people or, or adults 
when they're part of a group and if there's a top tier all the way down to the bottom within the group, then I would suggest that could be a negative. And people then could quickly become isolated. And rather than it being enriching and developing people and positive and a growth situation, that could be for the first time in five years of old age. She's better than me. He's better than me. And this whole thing works out. So for me, you know, the bottom one, sorry, was learning to deal with disappointments and learning to deal with not wanting. I was a very bad loser for a long time. Very bad loser. And I, and I feel now the reason I was a bad loser was because there was so much emphasis putting on winning. And when you lost, it was almost like a tragedy or a bereavement. Because there was so much of a focus put on winning. And for me, these are very, very important things. If we want to talk about sport as a vehicle for positive mental health and developing people in a positive mindset, I think these are very important questions that we need to ask before we get into the, the detail of it. For me, the motivational climate that is set is very, very important. Adults, adolescents, children, it doesn't matter. It's the exact same principle. The climate that the people that are working with the participants set is hugely, hugely important in my mind. And uh, I spoke with Maria today earlier, and we spoke about negative people and negative people infiltrating the dressing room and the impact that that could have on the dressing room. And I think if you're told and you're picked up on every tiny mistake, that's negative feedback that you're, you're, you're given to somebody, and that creates a negative environment, and that creates lower self-esteem, all things that are associated with uh, ill mental health. So these are very, very important points in my mind anyway. So the climate that's set is very, very important. An egotistical climate is basically the climate that's out there at the moment. An ego climate is really, I compare myself with the other player. I compare, we compare ourselves with the other team. And that can be very hard to take if you're not comparing really well. A mastery climate or a task oriented climate is a different thing altogether. That's about being the best that you can be, given absolutely everything you've got. You mightn't necessarily win, but you know you've given everything, and there's a purity in that, a real purity in that. Every single person in this room is different. Every footballer is different, every sports person is different, everybody is at a different level. So what you want to do more than anything is be the best that you can be. And in many respects, that's what we do. I just put that down because when I sat down to think about the presentation, I thought, I'm going to put down now what the Donegal climate is, what the, cli the motivational climate for the Donegal team is, and the climate we try to create with the team is being the best we can be. We don't deserve... Or we don't have the right to win. We have to fight for the right to win. We don't have that right to win. And all we want to do is try to create a situation where we're competitive that gives us the opportunity to win, I feel. And being the best you can be, if we're the best we can be this year, and Derry or Brown beat us in the next game, we've got to shake hands and say, we couldn't have given it anymore. But it's a positive mindset. It's one where you're challenging yourself and you're trying to grow as opposed to putting everything on the result and then having to deal with that negative feedback. So being the best you can be is very important. Striving for excellence. Fulfilling your potential. Hands up if you feel at the moment you're fulfilling your potential in life. Six people. <laughs> six people, six people is very good. Six people out of 500. I say that in the dressing room, not one person, not one person normally puts their hand up. Because everybody feels there's so much more in them, but it's tapping into that. Tapping into that. And I think fulfilling your potential, if you can get close to fulfilling your potential, you're living your life in the right way. And that's what we try to do. An honesty of effort. I think when we took over the team, one of the things we said was, we want the team to do the most hardest work in the country. And sometimes 
People say that about us, which makes you feel really good, because it means the honesty was there to make that happen. Team spirit, enjoyment, positive, a full focus on what you're doing, fun, being part of something special, a life experience, because we're all on a journey, and the next one is the journey, a learning environment, including myself, including the coaches, focus on the individual, because without the individual operating well, the team doesn't operate well, because the team is a, a multiple of the individuals. Focus on the team. Disciplined. We wanted them to be disciplined. Flexibility within the coaching staff. That every single person has issues in their life, and we have to deal with them issues, not disregard certain things, and work through situations with them. And I think when things like... You know, say alcohol or, or a bereavement or a, a split up with a, a partner comes into the situation, we try to give the players space to operate in and then when they come back, they want to be with the group again. I think that's important. Confidentiality, obviously, is very important. That's why we don't talk to anybody from our team very well. Except you. Except you. And, uh, and performance goals orientated. Now, what you might notice there quite right away is winning is not up there. It's not about winning for us. It's about being the best we can be and making peace with the result. And so my point is this. If we want sport to be a vehicle for positive mental health, then the motivational climate that we set is extremely important when we're dealing with any individual. The climate that we set is really, really important. <laughs> what would you call that? <laughs> Nothing crude. What would you call that? Brave. What was it? Brave. Yeah, brave. Self confidence. <laughs> Self confidence. You have to say that these two boys here are showing very good discipline as well. <laughs> I'm not sure about them. But self confidence. Self-confidence doesn't grow in an ego climate. It grows in a mastery climate and in a task climate. And I'm just going to explain that. Where does it come from then? Because this is important for anybody. Where does self-confidence come from? In a coaching, from a coaching perspective, it comes from successful performance. So if you're working with somebody and you give them a task, and it's not the hardest task in the world ever, and they fulfill that, they get a sense of achievement, and then the next task, and the next task, so it's building blocks all the time, and you're building confidence all the time, until you get to a point where you go into a game, for us, a game environment, or a competitive environment, or a recreational run environment, and you try to run, you try to play the game, and you're successful in that. You're better than you were. You're trying to be the best you can be, but you're better than you were. So you're getting positive feedback from a successful experience. The third one for me is the most important of all, is encouragement. The most important of all. And research will show that encouraging people is the, one of the best things you can do for anybody on this earth. And when we coach the players, when we're doing ball drills at 100 by an hour, all we say is, good, 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 well done, keep it going, great, great, keep it going, don't worry about it, because there's going to be mistakes. There's going to be mistakes. Pick it up. Get it going again. Get it going again. Don't worry about the mistake. And, and just bombard them. So at the end of a two-hour session, they're going home in the car thinking, Jesus, I'm the best footballer that ever played for nothing ball. <laughs> but they're going home positive. And respect is another big thing for us. And at the start, sometimes players would dip to each other. So I learned the rule that if anybody disrespected each other within the group, because I wanted the group to be sacred, we all have done a hundred press-ups. So there was an incident, something happened, and a player disrespected another player, and we all came in, and everybody done it, under press We get the 70s, it's difficult, the 80s, it's very difficult, 90, your arms are starting to shake, but we done it, and we come together as a group, and we say we don't disrespect each other, because when we need each other most, we need to fight for each other. We need to be together, not splinter. And that never happens anymore, for obvious reasons. <laughs> that never happens anymore because the respect is within the group. 
And I think the most powerful thing coming out of that is when my players are driving home, they're never, never driving home frustrated or angry or annoyed that a situation developed and somebody disrespected them and maybe they didn't get the chance to disrespect them back because it was nipped in the bud. And they're not driving home thinking about that. They're always driving home in a positive mindset because it's all done. And the other really key thing for me is when I was 28 or 29, like say Rory Cavan these players now, I felt it was my duty to tell the younger players what to do and to bring them on and so on and so forth. And the reality was when that respect is there and it's across the whole squad, I feel it gives the younger players a chance to flourish quicker because they're more confident within themselves because they're not being knocked at any time you've made a mistake. Why did you do that for? That was stupid. Give me the ball. Does that make sense? So I think that's very, very important. Self-confidence, obviously, is a huge issue in terms of people's mental health. Self-esteem is at the core of most mental health issues. And self-confidence is a direct cousin of that, if you like. So it's very, very important. It's very important in life, and it's very important. It's extremely important in, in a sporting environment. And if you're... If you know you're being successful in the wee tiny things and you're getting good feedback and performance and people's encouraging you all the time and we talked about today, Maria, about the, all the positive people in the sport team, if you're being bombarded with that there, you're going to get an emotional arousal of self-worth. I feel good. I feel part of something. It's enjoyable. It's hard. Don't kid. I'm not going to kid anybody. We train extremely hard. Extremely hard. But it's in the right context. I think that's very important. And that gives self-confidence, and hopefully that will give you optimal performance. For me, that's as important as well. Particularly working with younger people. You've got to plant a seed in their mind. Every single where I go, every school I ever have gone into, I say to the kids, you can be whatever you want to be. You want to be a surgeon? Be a surgeon. You want to be a doctor? Be a doctor. You want to be an accountant? Be an accountant. You want to be a tree surgeon? Be a tree surgeon. Whatever you want, it's out there for you. But young people don't understand that. Because their self-confidence is low. And I had it myself. I had it myself. I'm not good enough for college. I'm not good enough for university. I'm not good enough to do a master's. Same issues all the time coming into your life. And that's what a lot of people deal with. Adults and young people. Issues of self-confidence. Issues of self-doubt. It was very, very important. If you're working with people or if somebody's got an issue in their life, it's very important to plant the seed. You're a good person. You're a good person. You're working well. It's not easy. I know it's not easy. But you keep it going. You're a fighter. You're going to get there. You're going to overcome this. You've got to plant that seed. The very first day we came together in 2011 for a training session, I got the boys in a huddle. It was down in St. Michael's Pitch in Dunfanny. And I told the boys, we're going to win the Ulster Championship. We're going to win the Ulster Championship. Every single training session from that to the day we won the Ulster final, when we came into the huddle at the start of training and told the boys, we will be Ulster champions. We will be Ulster champions. Because you're planting the seed. It's as easy to say that as anything else. It's as easy to work towards that as, oh, we're prepared really well, hopefully it goes well. There's not a lot of conviction in that. So self-confidence for me, this is, a lot, this is a lot to do with it as well. Planting seeds, getting people to be the best they can be. This is why, in my opinion, thoughts lead to feelings, and feelings lead to behaviour. If you're being told you're stupid, what are you doing that for? Pick it up, Jesus Christ. That's the feedback you're getting. That's what you're going to think about. You're not going to feel good about yourself, and you're going to act in a certain way. If you're told you're going to be Ulster champions, and we're working towards that, and you're a very valuable part of this team, we're all going to work together. You're going to think about that. That's going to resonate with you. You're going to get a good feeling. You're part of something that's collective, and everybody's in it together, and you're going to have a certain behaviour type. So what we say and how we communicate is absolutely... It's gold dust. It's gold dust. And we need to be very, very aware of it, I feel. And particularly if we want to use sport as a vehicle to develop people's mental health, and be really aware that what you say and what you do has a huge impact on the people that you're working with. Okay? Okay. So that's my point. 
We want to move forward and we want to use it as a vehicle. The building blocks, for me anyway, has to be spot on. And I know Miles is going to come up and present and launch the charter. And I spoke about this with Marion this morning as well. Words are words and a charter is a charter. How it's implemented is what's important. You've got to live it to implement it. Not say, this is what we would like to do. This is what we're going to do. And we're going to live our life in a certain way to try and achieve that. That makes sense. That makes sense? Okay. Okay, so sport aiding mental health. Can it aid mental health? Yes, it can. It can. Just two uh, quick studies here. One uh, research has found that when you experience positive emotions and you think about positive things in your life, you're more likely to judge your life as meaningful. People that view their life as meaningful have positive mental strength. And that's very important. So, the positive emotions come from the thoughts lead to feelings and the feelings lead to behaviour. So you've got to plant that seed. You've got to plant that seed in people's end and open up new possibilities for them at a positive light. This is another one. All right. Second one. Researchers found that women who participate in club sports have a greater life satisfaction than people that just work out in the gym on their own or go for a walk on their own. So when there's a sense of belonging and being part of something and being involved in something, and we've all had that. We've all had something that we're involved in as part of a group and you know, there's a feel-good factor at the end of it and we've accomplished something. There's more staying power. So that's something worth thinking about as well in terms of using sport as a vehicle. Physical exercise and mental health. There's just two slides here. Self-esteem. A number of studies have shown conclusively that exercise has a positive effect on the way people view themselves. You feel good. You feel good about yourself. Okay. Stress and anxiety. Exercise has been found to be a convenient and manageable way of people helping to deal with the stresses of life. And that makes sense. We all know that. Go for a walk. You don't feel good. You go for a walk and you're out for an hour and you come back down. You go for a shower. All of a sudden, life is not as tough. It makes sense. And it doesn't cost anything. It doesn't cost anything. So, these tiny wee things in terms of sport and exercise are very important. Depression, research into physical activity and its effect has shown that exercise can help people overcome this state of mind to as high a level as resulting from psychotherapy treatments. Research has shown that. And again, I would say, it, it doesn't cost anything to try it. And there's no side effects, other than maybe getting a, a better looking body for yourself, you know. And then mood and emotion, a feel good factor, which is undeniable once you work out you get that factor, okay. So these are, from the physical point of view, things that can help people's mental state by just 20 minutes, a half an hour a day exercise, okay. What would you say that is, Marina? If you were to describe it? I would say it's a higher living for life. Higher what? Living for life. Look at its eyes. Focus? Yeah. Focus. In my opinion... <laughs> In my opinion, sport can teach people how to focus, and once you learn how to focus, you can use focus in other parts of your life. You can learn to use focus for studying, or work, or concentrating on something that's giving you a difficulty. See, the thing with focus is this here, once you know what it is, you become aware of it. Every, everybody in this room, I, I walked about for two weeks in bad form not knowing what was wrong with me. And then all of a sudden, this thing goes, a light bulb me out. That's what it is. That's what it is. That's what was annoying me. You know? And if I had a very high level of awareness about myself, I probably could have worked that out quicker. And that's what focus is. Focus, as a definition, is a connection between two things. When you're focused on something, you're connected with it. And for us, as sports people, we want our players to be connected with football team. And we want to try and put everything else in the backdrop, try and clear that away, and get that as 
smoothed over as possibly in terms of relationships and work and any, any issue going on in their life so they can just totally connect with football. And I feel that this is a very powerful mental skill that can be transferable and used when things maybe are not so good in your life. And it can give you a mental strength that you can use in your life. So it's, I think it's a very important one. We spoke about that and we spoke about self-confidence. I believe sport can give you self-confidence and as a result, self-confidence can give you a mental strength to deal with issues when they arise outside of sport. For me, sport can teach people to be brave and courageous. Why? Because you do something and you get into something that you don't... If we tell the football team 2011 we were going to win the All-Ireland, I don't think they would have believed us because we hadn't won the Ulster in 19 years. But because we went through Ulster and we won the Ulster Championship, our thinking then went into a new space. We created a new space for ourselves because of the hard work we had done. That, state, that, that gap was too big if we were going to tell them, you're going to win the All-Ireland. So by, by moving forward slowly, we created a new space. Then move forward slowly again, create a new space. And that's how you progress. And every time you move forward, you get a wee bit more courageous. When I was going from doing the David there at 23 years of age, to college, and then college, the university, and university, the master's, Tiny wee bit. I had push, pushing myself a tiny wee bit because I was creating a new space for myself every time. And I think sport gives people that, and a connection with sport gives people that from a mental point of view. And that's positive mental health, in my mind. I spoke about earlier, and I think this is a brilliant picture. Sport gives people a sense of belonging. And people that work with people in sport have a fantastic opportunity. I belong to a group of people now at the minute. And that belonging will stay with me from the day I die. What I've been able to experience with them and live with them and grow with them over the last three years will never ever leave me, nor them. And I think that's the way it should be. And it would be easy just to get out the whip and just crack the whip all the time and be greedy and be selfish about it and maybe one for one or two years and then a massive drop off. But it's not about that. It's about being part of something, the enjoyment that comes with that, the privilege that comes with being in a dressing room that everybody respects each other and growing together and that everybody's got faults and we can see through that and just grow anyway. I think that's very, very important. Sport, for me, gives you that really sense of belonging. And I've never felt more of a Donegal person than I have in the last three years. Because I can see it in all the people that I talk to all over the county. You meet people and their face lights up with excitement because the summer, what the summer's given to them. And that is a, that's a, you couldn't ask for a better gift than to see that in somebody. And to think that you're anyway involved in that or part of that process it's a great, great feeling, and that's what I'm talking about, belonging. We all come from Donegal, most of us. We all come from Donegal, and the belonging that comes with that is very, very special at this moment. And we should, we should protect that best we can. These are, these three, for me, and the picture of the boys is up there, but the middle one stands out for me. Lifestyle. And there was a culture in Donegal, I suppose, three or four years ago. And I think the biggest achievement in the last three years has been that some of our players have completely and utterly lived their life. That, to me, has been the biggest achievement. They're rock solid. They've got direction. They're humble. And they're leading a completely different life to the one they were leading four years ago. I think that's the biggest positive for me out of the whole process. That you can see people moving in a different direction. And it just proves that, you know, anything is possible, provided 
them four words that I keep on using. You've got a commitment, and when you commit, you've got something to focus on. And when you're focused, you must keep believing, even in the ups and the downs, what some of these boys have done. And the result of that will be achievement. And it doesn't have to be in all Ireland. It's just achievement in your life. Life satisfaction, as we stand here today, is a serious achievement, considering the climate that we're living in. Life satisfaction is a massive achievement. You have that in your life, and you're healthy. It's a massive achievement, in my opinion. So, discipline can be learned from sport and can be used in other areas of your life. The lifestyle that you lead can help you lead a very balanced lifestyle out of sport, and it's transferable. And commitment. You learn to commit to something means you stick with it. You've made a commitment. I'm going to stick with this. It doesn't matter. I'm going to stick with it. I think that's very important mental skill for your mental health when things are very, very difficult in your life. It's not easy. I don't know how I'm going to get through this, but I'm going to stick at it. And I make that commitment to stick at it. And these are transferable skills, in my opinion, that can be found through sport. You drink the water here. We're nearly there now. I've had it, I'm afraid these are the games make me more violent. Sport can moderate people's behaviour. Can moderate people's behaviour. Particularly young people. And it can change their outlook on life. We all can change our behaviour. I have a goalkeeping coach, Pat Sullivan. Last year we made a bet. The bet was first man to lose stone and a half. We were on holidays. It was the last night of holidays. We weren't feeling good about ourselves. And uh, first man to lose stone and a half. What are you going to put on it? Under pound, under euro. Okay. So the weigh-in was the night before the championship match last year. So this was Christmas. And then championship match on the 20th of May. And uh, nobody was telling anybody how the other person was getting on. I found out subsequently that he was under the weight two weeks before the weigh-in. But the day of the weigh-in, he was a pound and a half over. And I was a pound under. The problem with that is he never paid me the money. But the point I'm trying to make is, we moderated our behaviour. We were going in a certain direction. And we said, no, we're going to go in that direction. So the sweet stuff was out and the chocolate was out and the tea and biscuits were away with the team was out and just focused on that. Started running. It was simple. Because there was a commitment made and once the commitment was made there was a focus. Focus on. And then I just kept believing I was going to get there anyway. <laughs> Pat didn't. Um, and we changed in the space of four months. And the point I'm making is, is every single person in this room has got that capability. Every single person. And if you're down at the moment, or life is very tough at the moment, it's easy for me to stand up and say this, but I know that you've got the power inside you to make changes to your life that can be positive for you. I know that people can do that. And it's, it's so important that that message goes out there, number one, and that you can believe in yourself. Because believing in the absence of success is the key to sport, in my opinion. If you can believe you're going to win a match, Whenever it's your own, I've got you on the ropes. And they did. They kept believing. They kept believing. And it's not easy. You've still got to do it. I think you can do that. It'll help you immensely in terms of your mental health. The last one is this. Sport can help you to deal with disappointments. I would say this. Second last one. I would say this. If you're brought up in a culture where it's won at all costs, that's not as relevant. But if you're brought up in a culture where you want to do the best you can, give it absolutely everything, praise effort, not results, praise effort, not results, then you will learn to deal with disappointments and setbacks. And I like this picture. For me, I don't have an issue with losing anymore. I really, really don't. We lost the All-Ireland on the 21 final in 2010. Never look back in anger. Never. Because I know that we couldn't have given it any more. Couldn't have given it any more. Shake hands and you move on. Try and improve yourself and you try and get better. But that's it. 
It's not a begrudging situation and the referee and this and that. We weren't good enough by that much. Let's go back to the drawing board, make ourselves better, and just hush on again. That's striving for excellence that I spoke about in the second slide. I think sport, in terms of your mental health, can stretch you. This is a big part of, you know, in terms of my job with Celtic, stretching people is very important. Stretching them to open up new spaces for themselves. And that if you've got a name, there's a comfort zone, and then you're at a certain level, and you've got a name, you've got to stretch yourself to get there. I think, you know, that the saying on the right hand side, if you want something you've never had, you've got to do something that you've never done. That means moving out of your comfort zone, stretching yourself to try and find the answer. And for me, from a coaching, from a coaching point of view, that's what I find most enjoyable about the job is stretching myself and challenging yourself to come up with something better and more refined that, that will ask questions of the opposition and then the players then on the pitch stretching themselves to be the best that they can be. That's a phenomenal picture in any man's. But what's brilliant about this picture is the athleticism obviously and the ring is 10 foot 4 inches. And, and the ability to do that. That's Michael Jordan. That's Michael Jordan. Okay, one of the best basketball players. Probably the best basketball player ever to play the game. And he said, after he retired, I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot and I've missed I fail over and over and over again in my life, and that is why I succeed. And for me, sport and mental health, this is probably biggest of all. Resilience, sport can teach you to be resilient, and that resilience, please God, will stay with you when you're finding things mentally very, very, very difficult. And if it's good enough for Michael Jordan, it's definitely good enough for me, you know, and it, it encapsulates the human side of things in terms of we've all got weaknesses, we've all got flaws, but we just want to try and be the best we can be. And, um, and that's it really, that's, that's the message, that's, that's our philosophy if you like from a coaching point of view and how the team operates. And, um, and thank you very much. How brilliant was that? I mean, you're just so inspiring. You genuinely are. You're one of the most inspirational people I've ever heard. Now I'm going to bring up the panel to join Jim now, Patsy McGonigal, and you can come up, Anne Marie Ward and Miles Sweeney. You probably know them all, but briefly, Patsy Donegal Native has been the senior team manager with Athletics Ireland from 99 to the present. It includes four Olympic Games. He's a former head of sport at Letterkenny Institute of Technology, and he was the team coach for the Donegal senior GAA team on two occasions. He is team leader at the Finn Valley Athletic Club. You really welcome, Patsy. Anne Marie Ward is the highly. Anne-Marie Ward is a highly acclaimed endurance swimmer from Donegal and has received numerous awards and accolades including Female Swimmer of the Year 2010 and Donegal Sports Star Special Achievement Award. She was also named Joint Donegal Person of the Year in 2011 and she's currently Manager of the HSE's Training and Occupational Support Services for Adults with a Disability in Donegal Sligo Region. There's so much more to say about that. <laughs> And then, last but not least, Miles Sweeney is coordinator of Donegal Sports Partnership. He's been to the fore in many areas of sports development, including the Sports Inclusion Disability Program and the Cross Border Sports Development Program in the Northwest. As a sports person, his key passions are play football, of course, soccer, athletics, and boxing, where he's had loads of success. Give a warm welcome to Miles. <laughs> Questions and answers 
session. I'm not going to hog it. So who would like to ask the first question? Uh, what's Jim's opinion on antidepressants? Okay, fair enough. He's <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'm not going to pretend that I'm a doctor, first and foremost. Uh, my idea is sport, and um, I suppose in terms of being here today, I've been asked to talk on the issue of sport and mental health. I think that in my own work at Celtic, um, if one of the players presents with an issue, and um, they've presented with some issues that would blow your mind on some occasions, but when they present with an issue that's out of my own remit, then I have no issue uh, referring them on to from a clinical point of view. So I wouldn't have a strong opinion on antidepressants for that reason, because it's not my, my area, no. um, to be honest. No, absolutely. I mean, you know, you couldn't get a big, you're not a doctor, and yeah, absolutely. Okay, another question? Don't be yeah, see you at the back. There's two hands. If you can get a microphone down to the lady with the blonde bob. About the third from the end. Yeah, if you keep your hand up, that'd be great, and we'll give you a microphone. <coughs> uh, my question's for Jim. Jim, um, Major O'Donnell here. That was a fantastic, fantastic um, speech. I just think maybe you could do inspirational speaking after you've had your career with the uh, GAA. And I'm ever so sorry I didn't get to hear this before my stint as Celebrity Banished Door. I'm sure it would have helped me in a great deal. My question to you is, you know, we talk a lot about um, uh, motivation and, you know, in sport. And it's very easy to kind of, as you said, saying to the guys, come on, come on, it's, it's great. Uh, you're doing well, don't worry about it, keep, keep going. Um, even when I was doing my stint with Celebrity Banished or I was... I was um, labelled being extremely tough because I kept pushing. How do you um, pull somebody up who's um, uh, a messer in a positive way? How do you keep the whole thing positive, even though some of them are maybe taking the mickey, if you know what I mean?
I'm actually on the issue, just to bring you both before I go back to the floor, or both of you as well. Jim, Jim spoke about so many, many things. We spoke about the encouragement, resilience, and if you tie in sport with mental health, Anne-Marie, do you think they are both, like resilience, I suppose, to deal with life is incredibly important if you are suffering from some form of mental illness? and I suppose that element was sport and they encouraged me to take it up and um, I suppose you know it's, it's again back to what Jim was saying starting in a small way and building up and like I started with a very short swim um, and then people around me said oh you know you're 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 not bad at this, you know, do you want to um, try something longer? And it was people around me encouraging me to do that and um, having belief and uh, belief in me, you know, my able, that I was able to do that. And um, I suppose through um, through time then I just kept a little bit at a time and back to Jim, but Jim again was saying, sorry Jim, we keep going back. It's, um, I could just say, could relate so much to, to all of that. Uh, and, um, you know, they, it's, it's not all about the one in and and um, sometimes the disappointments is what makes you re resilient. And I've certainly um, been able to take a lot of that and transfer it to uh, my day-to-day -day life and, and work and family and everything else. And Miles, yeah, the, those issues of say resilience and encouragement, do you regard them as hugely important too? Vital, I think, absolutely vital in terms of sport. Um, I suppose, from my point of view, working in sports development um, and working very much in participation in sport, where we try and get people to take part in sport, it's so, so important. And that whole thing of encouraging, uh, raising the self-esteem, setting the goals for people so that they can achieve something. And it could be a case of maybe bringing somebody in that has very low uh, levels of physical ability. Mm -hmm. uh, and it could be a case of maybe setting a goal of maybe even walking for, a, for one kilometre or walking for 500 metres. That is so important, reassuring them, setting those goals and building on those goals then afterwards as well. Because they're not complex things, you know. I mean, I'm just thinking, like, you know, I have a seven-year-old. It was a sports day yesterday, and he just he lost and he was crying. But if you just say you were great, like, in other words, the encouragement you're talking about, it's almost what we almost do with our kids, isn't it? Now it's almost the same thing. thing. You'd have to wonder though, why is he crying? You know because I mean? he's a bad loser. Yeah. <laughs> but why is he a bad loser? Yeah, you know, this, know. Is the, this is the thing, and and because we're all conditioned to win, win, yeah. win, 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 win. Um, no, that's interesting. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, whereas, you know, for up to 15 years of age, people shouldn't know winning from losing, in my opinion. You know, they should just be out there. As Patsy said, what's going on in Donegal for the last number of years, Miriam, in terms yeah. of 5Ks and 10Ks, on a recreational level, has been absolutely staggering. Yeah. And there's there's probably too many on the calendar now, Patsy mm -hmm. would say, yeah. uh, <laughs> off and on, because there's so many going on. Yeah. But that's bringing people into um, a loop that yeah. we're never in that, in that group. And it's sort of not about one in the race. It's like, like, out of, say, 200 people running the race, there's about 10 people that could potentially win it. There's yeah. 190 there on the night for the really best of reasons. And for me, that's what the whole thing needs to go towards in terms yeah. of, you don't get me wrong, our, our team, it's all about winning in terms of trying to get over the line, but it's how you build towards yeah. that, and the concept behind that, for me, is the most important thing. I mean, maybe that is a bit in life as other, because young people today are brought up, and obviously all over the country, not just in Donegal, young men in particular. I think even little boys from an early age, it's too much about winning. Because they see it everywhere, don't they? So how do you protect young men from that? Well, the coach, sorry, 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 go ahead. Go ahead. No, just the, the, the coaches, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I mean, you see coaches on the sideline, and like under 12s, and it's, yeah. it's the coaches All-Ireland final. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And they want to beat the other team, and they want to beat the opposition, and the kids are looking at the coach, and they're getting that feedback. We have to win this game. This is, Jesus, if we don't win this, he's gonna, his head's going to explode. 
And that's the feedback that I get from the coaches as opposed to, okay, it doesn't really matter, let's just go out and express ourselves, enjoy ourselves, give it absolutely everything, and so we'll see how we get on. That's not happening. Yeah. And many, and, and, and in the team sports, anyway, it's not happening. Maybe different in the athletics. Yeah. It's a thing, in, you know, even in individual sports, and in, myself, you came in individual. I think that, I think that you've got it in an individual sport, even in, in that you've got to carry the team. You've got to absolutely carry the team. You've got to, you know, let number six, the sixth best runner, um, you've got to let him or her feel that she is sixth, is, is as good as need. She is as needed or he is as needed. And that's a bit of a talent as well, you know, that you have to bring to it. And a lot of patience required there and a lot of, but the contribution that you're making on this journey of this child who's beginning this life is just so, so, so seriously vital. And, you know, everybody in this hall, absolutely everybody in this hall, if you're sitting there and you're thinking, and you can think of people who impacted on your life, occasions in your life that impacted on you and sent you off in a different direction, that, is, that happens is all the time. But it's only on occasions. I told a story recently about when I was at primary school. I, I went to a primary school outside of Balbethe here, and I've two, two things that impacted big time in my life. I was thinking about this, approaching this. One, it was a summer's day around this time of the evening, this time of the evening, and indeed this time of the year. And um, the, the teacher, the late Master Heaney, who was a teacher in our local country school, he brought us all out, he sat us all down, and he ran these two, two older boys against each other, round and round, round and round. And one of them was to go on to play midfield for Donegal, who was Frankie McFeely, and the other he did a bit of handball, he was just a local postman. But for some reason, this kicked in with me, and then so many years later, about impact of people, the impact of people, the impact you on the day-to-day -day life of everybody. So if you're in sport, you have a serious, serious impact. And I went to boarding school in Derry, and a priest came along, a young priest, and he introduced us to athletics, and I found I had a talent for athletics. And the way I describe that then is, he gave me an opportunity, which I never, ever, ever forgot about. And that's what, that's what it's all about, and that's what sports does, and that's the atmosphere and the environment that sports create. And out of that, and out of that positivity along that journey, I think really, to be honest, there's your mental health. Mm -hmm. There's your exercise, there's your positivity, and there's the journey on an upward curve. And the people, and I say this to parents, you know, you leave them at the athletic club, examine to a few athletics, and I would say the same but they think. That the youngsters that they're growing up with, then they will go to secondary school with, and they will have formed bonds with kids from other schools with whom they have socially interacted. So, in effect, this is, this is such a life, you have just lit such a life in people's lives. So, everybody that contributes in your community is doing such an unbelievable job in terms of mental health. Very good. Like I, couldn't, I couldn't agree more with Patsy in terms of uh, people don't realise how much of an impact that they can have in their life. When I was about, two quick stories as well, when I was about six years of age, uh, at Glenty's, uh, when Wimbledon was on we were all playing tennis, and then whenever the football was on we were all playing football, and when the World Cup was on we were all playing soccer. But there was what were you doing with the test cricket? We were playing cricket, we were playing cricket, we were playing cricket. We were playing cricket. And, um, I was only about six years of age, and I had a tennis racket in my hand and a ball in my hand, and my mother was tying me laces, and uh, she said, love me in the leg, and she says, God, you have lovely wee legs. <laughs> and from that moment to this, I believe that I have lovely legs. <laughs> <laughs> because, because she planted, she planted the seed in my head. And it has never, it has never ever left. I don't know how to do that. It's never left. <laughs> <laughs> it, has, it has never left. It has never, left. It has never ever left me. That thought has never left. Me. And, and, and in a sporting context, um, I was about 18 years of age, and I was I was coaching the under 14s at, at the local club. And Columba McDyer and our God rest me, would have been part of the Donegal first, Donegal first one, then Cavan, and he won an All Ireland with Cavan, the first Donegal man Great. ever to win an All Ireland. And he's a Glenties man. And I was out coaching, and he came out onto the pitch, and his wife was along with Peggy, and he handed me a whistle, a blue whistle for Glenties, and he says, "You're going to be a great coach, you know." Mm. And 
From that moment to now, I've never lost the whistle. I still have the whistle. It's the whistle I wear on match day and everything else. And it's gone a lot. I'm missing sometimes in the dressing room. There's serious panic to find it. <laughs> but, and I've never lost it. I don't know how many years ago that is now, 23 or 24 years ago. Um, but he planted that seed in my head. You know, and it's like, you know, you're sort of, you're moving towards that in your mind all the time because the seed is planted. And that's the point Patsy's mm -hmm. making. We don't realise ourselves the power of working mm -hmm. with young people mm -hmm. and what you say, how much that can impact on their life. Patsy, so do you want to say something? Yeah, I just refer back to what I suppose what Tony Bates was saying earlier on as well, yeah. that one good adult. You know, yeah. we all had those, those adults, mm -hmm. especially in sport. Where you have the volunteers and you have so many people giving their time up yeah. they're supposed to promote and to support young people in sport and that one that one would that was so so important uh, yeah. and somebody that you look up to may not be a family member possibly a sports coach yeah. more than likely of some sort somebody is inspirational and i think that's that is so important like the men both of them just spoken about in their lives Amory. yeah i mean I, I think it's important though in, in schools too though that we um we look at across range of sports um, like I know as a, a young person at school if you didn't play football um, you know that was it or you know, at secondary school if you didn't play basketball or football and this body wasn't built for either of those sports <laughs> you had very little choice out, outside of that so um, you know I think um, if we're serious about addressing um, you know sport and, and mental health I think we do need to um, open our young people up to a whole broad range of sports and, um, you know, because there's very few people will make, um, you know, make the top um, in, in any of those sports, but to make it fun. And, I mean, we now have yeah. things like the Adventure, Coastal Challenges, um, and we have more and more um, opportunities. And, you know, if we, I think if we can get in at a young age and the sports partnership, we're doing, doing great work on that now, and it's good to see yeah, it. Um, but, you know, again, I think it's to maybe um, address some of the stereotypes there as well, that sport isn't just for... Um, you know, the, the, the lean bean fighting machines, you know, that sport is, is for everybody and there is a sport out there for everybody and we should just have testers and, um, you know, let people um, try out, what, you know, where, where their talents lie. That's a good point. I think, yeah. it, I think as well, Arian, you know, we, unfortunately sport, when we go to look for funding, when we go to look at, at resources, it, yeah. doesn't, it doesn't place it on the same level, it says health education, welfare, etc. Mm -hmm. And I think it should be because it can contribute right across right the board. Across, yeah. And I think we're tr that's, I suppose, from, from our point of view in the sports partnership, that's really what we're trying to do, is grow that sport that Anne-Marie is talking about, mm -hmm. create more opportunities, allow people to taste other sports as well, engage them in sport, so that, you know, we have a stronger, we have a better population going forward. People will have a better lifestyle. Yeah, I'm happy, Jim. That's a good point, is that it's not probably just the elite sports. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and it's just not about the kids. Yeah. It's about you people. It's about people of the age range as well. I mean, we, we, we in our sport have this thing called fit for life, you know, and it's, um, it really is just fit for life, just being fit for life. And, you know, everybody, are, you know, there's hundreds, of, I don't think all, there are thousands involved in fit for life. And it's, it's, it's social. Mm -hmm. It's physical and it's social. And I know, you know, this is, this is the normal Sunday of the thousands of these people, or weekends, or Friday, Saturday, and Sundays. It's clear that, for example, they're, they're, talking, they're talking about it, they're doing it during the week, they're meeting during the week, they're interacting during the week, and then they're going and then they're having a cup of tea. There's always this cup of tea and, and a bun or something afterwards. And actually, they say it's a new going out in some respects in this recessionary age. And yeah. it's, it's fit for life. And if you think about that, those words for a minute, that's, that's for this age range. So it's just not about the kids. And the other thing was, was mentioned about the school thing. I mean, we are, now, we are now dealing with an issue in schools, in primary schools, particularly where the kids can't play. And there's so much learning to be gained from play. And, you know, there's this limit on play. So what's that all about? Yeah. And, and, you know, if they don't play and they don't, you know, I, we, we know, you guys know that from your time growing up that you, you played yeah. and you probably walked home from school in many instances. So basically, that's gone. So the school is key. And Anne-Marie's point, in my opinion, is, is serious because, you know, we've got to throw out a, a number of disciplines out there to these kids. Because only 15 can start on the team, this football team. Mm. What, about every, what about the other 200? So we've got to throw out a lot of disciplines here. And 
There's a lot of agencies and a lot of people need to do a lot of do a lot about it. And just a big day out like today is brilliant. And I absolutely congratulate Frank and Donegal County Council. But we've got to go beyond today and, and deal with it. Yeah, yeah congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Do I, I'll go back to the floor. Have I got another question from the floor? Yeah, I have a question for Anne-Marie Marie, uh, yep. Ward and also for Jim, maybe. Yep. Uh, I don't know how many people know that Anne Marie's going to be swimming very shortly between the Alaska and Russia. Now that's a pretty enormous task and I just want to know what motivates her to do something like that. <laughs> Jim, I would like to ask you, you talked earlier in your presentation about potential. Have you reached your potential? Oh, good question. <laughs> I'll take Anne Marie's response first, please. <laughs> okay. Hey, you should be doing my job. You're very good. <laughs> okay, I'm Marie first. What uh, drives you? What motivates you? Um, I suppose, I mean, it's going back to, um, you know, I think um, Tony Bates talked this morning about doing something good. Mental health is about doing something you love yeah. and having the confidence to go and do that. And other speakers would have talked about, uh, you know, um, once you achieve something, you shouldn't stop. You should maybe just, you know, stretch your mind that little bit further and see what your mind and body can do. And I suppose over the last 10 years, um, I've surprised myself in terms of what, what the body and, more importantly, what the mind um, can achieve. And um, I suppose, you know, um, I mean, I've achieved what I want to achieve in, in a lot of the, the channels. And uh, then I started doing some um, winter swimming, ice swimming. Uh, and uh, was <laughs> uh, and I'm very lucky and privileged to be uh, invited onto an international relay team to swim from um, Russia to Alaska um, wow. this summer. So it's um, it's a huge privilege for me, and I suppose in terms of what drives me, I mean that you know it's. Um, like when you're invited to something like that, I mean, as I say, you take it as a huge privilege and, and it's a, a, another opportunity to stretch your, your body and your mind because I think we never know, you know, what we can achieve unless we go and try it. So um, I suppose from that point of view, uh, it's the, um, you know, it's, it's a challenge. And uh, I think the day we, we, we stop challenging ourselves is uh, it's a day, not a good day for our mental health. I think we should applaud her, though. That's a big thing. You're mad. <laughs> okay, Jim, how do you reach your potential? Is that what you asked him? Yes. Well, before I answer that... Uh, <gasps> He's we, turning to a politician. We, um, <laughs> we, would talk, we would have talked about Anne-Marie within the Donegal team in terms of resilience. Wow. You know, the ability okay. to, to swim 20 or 30 miles in Arctic conditions. You know, the mindset to go through that and to keep going and what must be going through your mind every mile. It must, it must be incredible in terms of just um, pure out and out resilience to get from A to B in that environment is it's staggering, you know. And I just, you know, like say, I don't really know, but it's, it's definitely very, very commendable, I have to say that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> In terms of fulfilling, yeah. Can I say, I'm just going to say on Anne Marie, just as the motivation thing, and I didn't tell Anne Marie this story ever before. We were in Gothenburg a number of years ago, European Championships, and you guys were doing a really around the country. And you, this particular night, we were in, Gerbil O'Rourke was in a final, and I had just done a team talk earlier in the day, and this came up. And I remember getting in touch to say they were 20 miles off the Galway coast, and I was using that motivation. And we were in Gothenburg, and that was the link on that particular Saturday evening in, in Sweden. Oh, Sorry, fantastic! Off you go. The question was: Have you reached your potential? I would say, I say in my mind now, probably fifty to sixty percent. And I would say. Um, the reason I would say that is because I, I feel I'm only starting to get confident now okay. and, and my own ability. And um, you're learning all the time. It's a very fast-moving environment. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're trying to get a grip of it and also navigate your way through it at the same time. And having been successful for the last two years, you're just starting to get confidence now. But once you go with, you know, 2% past that, 
thing you could lose where you're at. So it's focus is very important and perspective and where you're at, you know, but in terms of uh, potential, that's what I would, I would rate it at. And, you know, I think if you could move forward again, you'd undoubtedly create a new space for yourself and the thing would change again anyway. It's a ceiling, it's a never-ending journey, and that's the exciting thing about it. And that's the same for every single one of us. You could start, you could make a decision today to start something, you know. And can I say the start, lads? You know, yeah. in terms of the game plan, I say, if I went into the pub tonight and I started throwing darts, okay, and then I went in tomorrow night and start throwing darts, and the night after that, and the night after that, and the night after that, and the, I'm going to get good at darts. Mm. That's the reality. If it's snooker, it's the same thing. If I go down to snooker hall, night after night, I'm going to get better at snooker. So if you're connected with something and you're connecting with a game plan and you're working on that all the time, you're going to improve it and you're going to get better. And that's why I think it's a never-ending story. And for anybody here today that decides, I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that, not I would like to, I'm going to do it, make a commitment, then you're going to head away in a different direction. And you don't even know where that direction is, but you know you're going in a direction. And that's a very positive thing. It's a very positive mindset. And then you can reevaluate moving forward and say, okay, I've done that, now I'm going to go here. And that's very positive again. You can spiral anywhere, but you're moving forward and you're challenging yourself and you're challenging yourself to be the best you can be. And I think that's it's a very simplistic uh, yeah. model, but it's a very powerful one, I think. And it could work for anyone in this room as well. On, on any level, on, in business, mm. in business, in sport, if you put a serious focus into something, you're going to improve in that area. Business, sport, um, your mental health, physical health, whatever it is, you're going to improve that if you put a focus on it. That's great. George. <laughs> Any more questions from the floor? Oh, yes. Hello. Where we Go on. Hello, I'm here. Oh, hi. Uh, the here, down this head. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it's not really a question. It's more of an observation, maybe, uh, in relation to stress and anxiety, which maybe is not I should have mentioned earlier. But uh, it's just to say that stress and anxiety can be very hard to re recognize. And a lot of people sitting here today could be suffering from stress and anxiety, and, and lots of people walking the streets. And it's just so difficult to recognize it because I know from my own personal experience that I was suffering from stress and anxiety for a long time. I didn't realize it and how daunting it can be. And uh, would anybody, it's just an observation, I wanted to say that. I, I come from a farming background and a musician. And uh, even though I recognized my problem with stress and anxiety, I, I meet farmers today and people in the state that I chat to my friends, and I know they're even worse than me. And they don't even recognize it. So, just if anybody would like to say anything on the importance of recognizing the person they say. And once you recognized it, did you then go and seek help for it? Yeah, I did. And you're yeah. in a good place now, feeling good? I'm fighting to get there. You I'm, what? I'm struggling to get there, but uh, I'm All getting well. there. Well, by being here today and even talking about it means that I'd say you're very much on the road to getting there. Thanks for talking well, to us. Well, thank you. Um, yeah. I, I would like to ask a question. Why is there so little integration between sport and disability? Every, every time I go out to a club, we are told, you must sit there, they sit. There is absolutely no integration. If you go to the swimming pool here in Larry Kenny, the old swimming pool had the facilities now. The new swimming pool has gone five years, and we still haven't got lift on, lift off into the swimming pool. And every time we ask a little question, why, we get one we answer called cutback. And it's crazy. And if you look at this conference today, it's a disgrace that there's so few people in wheelchairs or even disability here at the conference today. There is no interaction. We need to get out there and we need to get together. The gap is so far. When I was in Scotland years ago, I went to a club, I went to a hospital called Mary's Scout. And the people that used to come out and take us to matches every Saturday were Glasgow Rangers. So I became known for a while as the only Fenian supporter of Glasgow Rangers football team. <laughs> and I'm proud of it because Parkhead had absolutely 
no facility is good, bad, nor different. And it's the same in Ireland. People don't look at us as people. We look as if we're a race apart. And we need to bridge that gap through sports or to anywhere possible. Okay, thanks. Dr. Hall. Yep. Just, just can I just Miles, say this yeah. from the sports partnership's point of view, um, I suppose we do have a, a sports inclusion disability program running since 2008, uh, and that is the focus there is around participation, getting people with disabilities either involved in programs or giving them the opportunity to be part of sports programs, but also in terms of integration within the club sectors as well. And the other element of that is education and training, where we're trying to, I suppose, work with the sports volunteers to give them better capacities and how they can work with people with disabilities as well. So that program is running there and if, if you want to contact ourselves in the sports partnership, we will definitely we will offer you okay. the opportunities to take part in the sports. Okay, well that's good. Uh, make sure you contact them then. No. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you for that. Thanks for that contribution. Yeah, this, yeah. Thank you. Um, just a question for, for Anne-Marie, if I may. may. Um, Anne-Marie, when you're doing your endurance swimming, 20 hours, 22 hours, whatever, do you ever get a stage where you are, just something isn't working, you hit a wall or whatever, mentally, and you, you feel like you can't go on? Or, or have you ever come across that? And if you have done, how did you actually get going again on, and uh, to complete your unbelievable swims? Yeah, um, <laughs> <laughs> I've had, had a few walls. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's a good question because uh, uh, obviously channel swimming or long distance endurance swimming, you know, you, you have to be prepared to spend a lot of hours um, in um, very difficult conditions and unknown conditions. And uh, I suppose it's, you know, you don't really have any parameters um, and it might take you 10 hours, it might take you 20 hours if, if you're lucky enough to, to get there. Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose uh, a particular, um, I suppose, difficult swim for me was um, on my fourth attempt at the North Channel to swim between Ireland and Scotland. And uh, I know, uh, you know, I had um, it's, uh, the three previous attempts are long stories and a lot of disappointments and all of that, so I, I haven't time to go into any of that. But um, on the fourth time, you know, it was a case of, uh, you know, I, I had to do it. I knew the conditions were right and that was the only thing that was going to stop me from doing it. And I know it about the probably the 13th, 14th hour um, in the water and w we were going back into darkness um, th that following night and um, I mean, like for anyone who doesn't know the sport you, you know, you're in a bathing suit and pair of goggles and you haven't touched the boat or lifted your goggles or stopped for all that time so, and I know I was sort of just thinking to myself um, I was cold and I was tired and I thought I'm, I'm you know, uh, for one minute I thought am I going to do this and I knew I'd, I was hitting the wall and um, I suppose again drawing on what everyone else was talking about earlier the focus um, and if you know I knew I had prepared for this and I had you know and I thought get that thought out of your head now because if you think you're not going to achieve it then you know you're finished and I suppose for me it was drawn on the strength of the team that I had around me and I knew they were all on the boat and I couldn't see their faces because it was dark but I could see their outlines and their silhouettes and they were all hanging over the boat and um, it was maybe about you know about 20 feet away from me and um, I just drew my strength from them and it, you know it's, it's like support and I suppose again parlating it to some of the, the discussion earlier about us if we all need support we all need people around us that believe in us and um, it wasn't me that, that got to the Scottish coastline it was my team on the boat um, and every time I turned to breathe I just drew a bit of strength from them because I knew you know 
they had put, they had invested so much in me in terms of they had spent hours and hours and hours training with me. They had, they had come over to the North Channel. I think we'd spent 45 hours in previous attempts trying to get to Scotland in all sorts of drastic conditions and we'd seen hospitals and we'd seen all sorts of things. So, um, you know, uh, I suppose it's the, um, it's, it's the focus and, and, you know, I just needed to put my head down and I just went into a mantra and all I could say is the boys will bring me home, the boys will bring me home and they were there and, I mean, they did, they took me home um, and, as I say, it's, it's that, it's that, it's that mental focus, I think, that, that everyone needs to achieve. And, you know, again, it's about believing in all of the people um, that's around you. So that's probably one memory I have. <laughs> that's amazing. To hear. I'm going to get a couple of minutes left. I'll take the gentleman here in the second row if we can get you a microphone. Oh, do you want to just go to get your microphone? Is that okay? Just for one second. I'd like to ask Jim McGuinness, is he always as cool and diplomatic in the dressing room or behind the scenes as he is here today? Because I have seen other managers now, to name a few, uh, namely late Paddy O'Shea of Kerry, Paul Pillar, Caffrey of Dublin, who come to mind. Some of their language has not been very diplomatic. <laughs> Well, language, language is a different thing, but it's, <laughs> it, it depends where the language is directed and in what context is used. Um, for me, the only time I get apprehensive in sport is when I'm not prepared. That's the one time that I get apprehensive and I get touchy and uh, I, I almost get annoyed with myself. And when the boys are not fit at the beginning of the year and I know they're not fit, it's like... You know, they should be doing that, but I know they can't do that. Mm. And, 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 you know, you have a certain type of feeling inside you. In terms of being in the dressing room, all anybody wants is to get a really strong run into the game, <clears throat> your preparations to go really well, for you to know that they know what it's all about, to impart every bit of information that you have in terms of what's going to happen, what you want them to do, and how you want them to do it. I call it the invisible stick. So if people understand with complete clarity what it's about and they're not doing it, it's like, hold on a second here, you're not doing that. Mm. It's the invisible stick. You're not beating them with it, you're pointing it out because that you know that they know. Mm. And sometimes I see under 12 managers on the sideline mm. and they're roaring at kids, Jesus Christ, what are you doing? And the kid's like, well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. I'm only 11 years of age. I haven't got a clue. And you haven't told me. So am I supposed to work this out on my own? And it's the exact same thing with the senior footballers. You want to get them to a level that you feel that they know what the gig is all about. And then once that's done and dusted, which should happen, in my mind, a week or ten days out from the game, you should have all that covered. Once you get to that point, then you've got to put the faith in them to go out, deliver the performance, and be the best that they can be. And you've got to, obviously, there's decisions to be made on the sideline over the course of the game, but at that stage, it's almost too late. You know, your preparations, our preparations for Tyrone started at Christmas. That's the reality, and we work towards that end game. And uh, our preparations now will start again on Sunday at half five once that Derry and Down match is over. And that will just be manic for two weeks, trying to get the thing into their mind. What's it all about? And hopefully then they can go out and deliver. Great. We're going to take one more question. Cause just right. Yeah. Hello. Hello. You're safe enough today, Jim. I'm not going to ask you an awkward question today. Um, this question is really for Patsy McGonagall. I've known Patsy all my life um, from... Uh, Changing behind the ditch in, in the cool park to the state of the art, to the state of the art uh, complex he has over there now in, in the Fin Valley Athletic Club. Um, just recently, we know of Patty's uh, achievements not only at local level but at national level and international level. Um, just recently, you held over there, Patsy, the 43rd annual schools for children athletics uh, meeting. 
were children from, I believe, somewhere around six-year-old till about eight, ten-year-olds, twelve-year-olds. Um, and you were working down there with those kids, and you were, you were uh, coordinating the whole event. And my question to you is, Patsy, how can you still motivate yourself to do that at a very, very basic grassroots level after uh, doing it at the, at the very top of international level? Yes, thanks. Thanks for the nice, kind words. It's, look, it's a question I ask myself all the time because um, I got to London and I had started off Olympic Games collections and World Champions Europeans back in 89 in Seville and gone through all Olympic Games but and I thought, right, I'll, I'll, I'll try and work it towards London. And I had a brief conversation with somebody outside and just before we came in and we were talking in a similar vein. And then London came and then I had to ask me, there's Rio and it's four years away. And you think, so what are you going to do, Patsy? You're, you told your wife back in 2000. That was it. <laughs> so you survived for another four years and you're still in the same house and you're thinking, right. But on this occasion, I kind of few, few things. Um, I'm still, still in good health. Um, I've still got a lot of energy. I still have a lot of passion for this. I believe unbelievably in my own community. Um, and, and I just, and to an extent, and to be, being honest, I don't know how to, I don't know how to, to get off it. <laughs> Basically. And that's, that's it. And that's and you know, it's like when I was coming up to retire, I worked for a long, long time in IT and other Kenny, and I got scared because mm -hmm. I thought I was going to retire. And I thought, now, how are you going to handle this? And I haven't thought about it even since. I left the keys in the desk the day I left, and I never, ever, ever even thought. I don't even know where I worked because I was so busy moving forward. The kids, we had 1,300 children competing at Finn Valley on, on, on Wednesday. It was a beautiful day. It was a great occasion. Mm -hmm. It was just, it was just idyllic, really, and so much joy and so much delight, and particularly, particularly when they're local kids and they're from around the county, and you know the people, and that's that's key. And Jim related to that as well. You know, he said, you know, about going to Donegal and, and about being Donegal and about being acknowledged in Donegal, and for me, that's 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 serious stuff. And you know, you don't go out and shout it out, but it's about the people. And it's about the children, and it's about the grandparents, and some of them, believe it or not, started with me, these grandparents, and I'm still there. And then, the other thing, to change it from Bernard's question for a second, when you're in this position, and you're an Olympic team manager, and you're in, this, you're in the news a bit, and you're getting a bit of profile, and you're still grounded enough, that nine and ten year old, when you're walking towards them in a the field, mm. they need you to, to, talk, to say something. Even if it's only to punch them in the arm or touch them in the head or just to move on, they need to know. And this is why this is so important, this about this influence. Just not about me. I'm back to the same kick again about the influence of people in sport in Donegal and in, in any community. And I love coming back. I love going down to the club. I love the kids and I love being involved with them. And, I, and I'm so, so, so lucky to have some great people working with me who I always acknowledge. So that's just me. That's just the way it is. And please God, with health and everything else, you just you just batter on. Um, with disability, Donald, um, very, very happy to say, uh, uh, let's say we've just about, within weeks of finishing the summon pool over at the Athletic Club and all the facilities, it's absolutely, totally, and the Donegal County Council are working, working very, very closely with me on this, that it's totally disabled. For disabled people, they will be delighted with it. We have gone down to the very element of something like a shower head, you know, because I mean, a fixed shower head is no good to a disabled pe person. So we've got it. We got. We think we've got it really, really, really well, and and we have put disability top of the list in the new facility, and um, that's very important. We're just coming to the end, though, answering just the question there that Patsy answered, I think we should pay tribute to him. It's incredible that you still want to impart all your incredible experience and your Thanks. talents Thank to you the young much. children here. So well done to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, listen, I can't take any more questions or the mayor will kill me. And that would be sad and my children would be sad tonight. So 
we're going to do, just bear with us for a couple of minutes, we're going to launch the Donegal Sports Partnership Health Charter. And a very special person is going to launch it, Danny Ryan. Are you coming to talk to me? No. Danny Ryan, former Irish boxing champion. He boxed 39 times for Ireland at senior level. He boxed at the Commonwealth Games and the World Boxing Championship. And he's now a mental health nurse in the Donegal Mental Health Service. Please give a really warm welcome to Danny, who's going to launch this for us. I nearly boxed Danny Ryan. <laughs> anyway, in fact, Miles is going to do that launch first, the presentation. Yeah, I'm just going to do Great. a presentation Brilliant. here on. Uh, Off you go. Sorry for the confusion. No, don't worry. Um, it's all my fault. <laughs> uh, I suppose, first of all, uh, the charter's here, and I suppose we, uh, what we want to do and what the sports partners want to do is get the charter out into the community, but of course we want to, I suppose, give people an idea of what the charter is about. Um, and in fairness, listening to Jim's speech, you are nearly sworn that he wrote the charter, because there's so much of what he has said actually in the charter itself. If I could have the flipper here just for a second. Um, I also want to thank Mayor as well, just on behalf of the Sports Partnership, uh, for given us the forum as well to be part of the, of the conference here today. It's been a powerful conference. We're delighted with it, um, and we're delighted to be part, part and parcel of it as well. Um, as I say, the sports partnership, we're, we're established in 2001, um, and we're very much involved in one areas I mentioned there earlier on about, in, in terms of participation sport, recreational sport, and so on. Um, Jim, I suppose... Second here. No, wrong way. Yes, benefits. Um, Jim and, and a number of speakers have talked about the whole the benefits associated to sport. And I'm not going to go through. Going to start going through them whole them again. Obviously, we have the associated physical benefits of being involved in sport as well, um, in terms of you know reducing the risk of, of the, many, the very many corn, or chronic diseases that are out there. The therapeutic role, which Jim has mentioned, the positive influence on mental health, which we've talked about, the whole area of camaraderie, the social. Uh, connections as well through, through our clubs and through our communities and also a very, very important area, the area of enjoyment and that's, that's important and even for the likes of the Donegal senior team or any elite athletes, it's important as well as well that they enjoy what they're doing and they're in, they're in it for enjoyment as well as, as the achievement. Um, obviously they improve self-esteem uh, and last, lastly there in the, in the, the, the area that we've been touched on all day is the whole area of the influential role of the coaches and the sports leaders within the clubs themselves. The role they play in influence uh, the, the young people within, within the clubs. Um, just to give people a bit of background, and we did have a working group, as the Mayor mentioned earlier on, in relation to developing today's, the theme of today's conference. But also in terms of developing the charter, we had some consultation work to do as well with very many community groups that were out there. And we had some great sessions with them. Among the people that were in the, the, the consultation sessions were athletes from coaches, uh, athletes from, sorry, from clubs. We had parents there as well, which were very important. Other support organisations. We had national governing, governing bodies of sports. We had the clubs. And out of that, then we developed the outline of the framework for the charter. And what was coming back was that there was a need for something. There was a need for some sort of consistency within clubs. Um, I suppose clubs, and we talked about this whole thing, this winning thing all the time, and clubs for many years have gone down that road of looking at winning and winning at all costs. And I suppose what we're trying to do through the charter here is sort of change the culture of, of sports clubs so that they're more recreational, they're more open, that people can come in and take part and feel that they're part of it. And building that community club is really what we were talking about here within the charter. Uh, we felt that the, the, the consultation felt as well that there was a lack of information for our clubs. So there's a need there to develop training, there's a need to develop, to, to develop resources, and so on. Um, to address obviously the current issues, and we, we're here talking today about mental health, and that is a huge, huge issue. And there's a huge sporting fraternity out there, a huge sporting body out there, a huge sporting community. And again, they need that support as well. And hopefully through working with those working people, 
we can, you know, at least engage with them and, and at least apply and maybe support uh, the whole area of posture and mental well-being. Uh, it needed to be a whole club approach. It was no point having it just for the, for the young people that everybody needed to engage in, in the charter. So from the very, very young to the very, very old uh, needed to be involved. And again, the main theme that came through in terms of, of, of the, all of the consultation was the word respect. We felt that was the key, key word that we were getting, uh, and Jim mentioned it as well in terms of his presentation. A couple of models out there as well, uh, in terms of international models, and the Australian Sports Commission have a good sports model, and that's very much around this whole um, developing a, a kind of a new ethos or a new culture for us. And they have around about 5,000 clubs involved in that whole area of developing, using the club for much more than just the provision of sports, but also in terms of promoting well-being in sports. We're, we're familiar with the Lean on Me programme here in, in, in Ireland, obviously through the work that the likes of Alan Cunlan has done from rugby and also uh, uh, Katrina Curran has been involved in that programme as well. The English Football Association have also got um, a number of programmes involved. Uh, Positive Sco Coaching Scotland are looking at different models as well in terms of coaching. And in Ireland here as well, the GA have taken an initiative here, the Healthy Club. Again, again they're looked much more than just playing, playing the game or playing all their games, but also in terms of developing a good club structure, a good strong club structure that embraces the, the, all the very, very many issues that are out there. This is sort of the, the main boards of, in terms of the Charter, and there's quite a number of, of, of messages, and we've used this as a sort of an anagram here. And you'll see the words here, the, the, the key words, uh, as most respect, encourage, support, participate, enjoy, communicate, and tolerate. And really that's what we're trying to get to in terms of this charter. We're really trying to get clubs to buy into this in terms of, of uh, I suppose, setting their clubs up in that, in that way. Um, this is sort of other key messages as well. And the charter is, I suppose, we have a front, or what we call a poster board, but we also have resources as well that the club can integrate into their, into their constitutions. And we don't want it to be something that's filed away within the club. We want it something that's going to be live. So having a board with your clubhouse or in your dressing rooms or wherever to illustrate the word respect, I think it's going to be key as well. And hopefully that will engage young people. It will engage the parents. It will engage the sports leaders. It will engage even the, the groundsmen, the bus drivers. Anybody that's involved in the club um, will be engaged, hopefully be engaged by... Uh, the respect board. A number of key messages there, promote mutual respect at all times, including welcome everyone to the club, not tolerate negative attitudes or behaviour. And Jim focused on that as well today in terms of keeping things positive all the time and so, so important, especially with our young people. Uh, create a safe environment where enjoyment is paramount. Accept decisions of officials, club management gracefully. Um, highlight participation, good sportsmanship and, and achievement, which is huge. A uh, link with external agencies, and I suppose the, the whole idea of, of, of developing the charter as well is that we can at least ser uh, signpost the services that are available. And we have around about 25 different services around the, around the, um, the auditorium here today. Um, we are going to work with one service in providing training, and that's Jigsaw at the minute. I'll just go through that in a second. Uh, in terms of future development, our next steps... And Jim was very good to point out as well today that there's no point having words. We need to back it up with some sort of actions. Our plan for the Charter is this. Uh, we hope to meet with the stakeholders. And what I mean by the stakeholders, the key people that are involved in sports in Donegal, the people that are involved at the head, of, at the head of the GA, head of soccer, head of rugby, head of all the various sports, get them together because what their support, we can get the Charter down into the clubs and we can reinforce that with the clubs. Uh, without their support, it won't... It won't be as positive, but we need them to bring that positive message down into the clubs and down into the communities as well. The partnership approach is what we're all about as well. We are not um, a mental health uh, organisation. We're a sports development organisation. So ourselves working with the likes of Jigsaw. And Jigsaw, I was at the launch a number of weeks ago that Tony Bates had talked about. Inspirational to see the young people, what they, what they have achieved with the, with the Jigsaw project. And ourselves working with Jigsaw in terms of developing and delivering training to the communities. So we're hoping to engage the CAC with the clubs and then provide the training through the Jigsaw programme. Uh, we will have a pilot phase. We will focus probably on a number of areas to pilot it uh, and, and develop the club engagement. Um, 
And again, it would be important as well that we look at the quality and review it and look at what we're doing. It's very much a fluid uh, process. Uh, we're going down, I suppose, a road that we are a journey that we haven't been in the, in, 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 in the world in the sports partnership. So it's a, it's a new, new concept for us. Uh, so we will be learning as we're going along. And so hopefully from that learning then we will help, help develop and, and, and improve this, the, the process uh, moving forward. Okay, that's basically it uh, in terms of the background and in terms of the jigsaw. You see the resources that are here at the front uh, as well. Uh, and as I say, we will be moving forward. And any people that are involved or interested, we have an expression of interest for them down the back there at the active Donegal uh, table down at the back. So if anybody from here from clubs or anybody that's interested in working with us in terms of developing the charter or rolling the charter at your own club, by all means, uh, drop your name and your details down to the table. Thank you very much. That's great, Miles. Thanks very much. And now, once again, I'm now going to invite Danny Ryan to come up and launch it formally. Thanks very much for the welcome. It's ironic that I'm here today. 31 years my sporting career started uh, with Fun Valley Athletic Club and also Twin Boxing Club. Here I am, 31 years later, standing up here in the same stage as Patsy Monigle. Um, them coaches in my lifetime and in a full boxing club installed the right sort of discipline and, uh, and, and, and training in, 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 in my system, I suppose, in, in my head, and, and installed the right, the right things. And basically now I'm sort of passing that on now to, to others, and I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to, to the start in life that I had, both for full boxing club and Tom Towns and Finn Valley Athletic Club, and also my father and mother for support there too. I'm, I'm humbled and, and very honoured to uh, launch this sports partnership charter here today. Um, it's a big thing for me. Um, basically, I've sports, what I live and breathe, and um, I'm honoured to be here. I have to co commend the speakers for today because they were very educational and um, raising awareness of a lot of a lot of important issues here today. I think we have a lot to take home with us. I think it was great talks, and, and again, well done to all. I'm going to give three stages of a young athlete's sports career that I think is very pertinent to, to, to them, as it, as it was personal to me. And I think it's relevant to today, and with all the speakers and all the coaches that's in the audience that I can see, and those, those three stages that I think is very pertinent to the young sports athlete that's thinking of aspiring to make a career in sport. And <clears throat> the three stages I've sort of... Uh, personalised, as I say to myself, in the first stage was leaving home. And I left home, uh, I was only I was 20 years of age, early 20s, I left home to go to London. And basically I travelled the world as an amateur. But <clears throat> nothing prepared me for my trip to London uh, to take up professional boxing. I went to a hotel in, uh, under the flyover in Canning Town. It was rough, but it was, you know, there was, uh, they'd stopped serving food, it was run down. So as a young fella, full of confidence and full of sort of uh, being focused and, and very much uh, wanting to take on the world and, and learn my sport in boxing, there was a first stage there that was, I was having to get breakfast and I was having to get my meals out of the shop. And I just felt... Maybe things wasn't right there, but it wasn't that long. I got an apartment and got settled in close to, my, to the actual boxing gym. And, and from, from there on, everything was 100%. And my training career blossomed. But for coaches here, I think it's a very important time is that stage. If you're making the transition, if you're setting your young athlete and you're setting them up in, in, a, in an environment that's going to be out of their comfort zone, it's away from family, it's a big thing. And you want your athlete all the time, you want the athlete focused and, and, and thinking of nothing else but learning the new sport and learning their new, the new techniques that they'll be learning to continue on their sport. So as coaches, awareness of that, I, I thought, I've thought of the last few days about this and thought, 
people will say to me, God, now sure, people go studying, people go on scholarships, but a lot of the time they, they go with fellow peers their own age and there's a, there's a sort of a identification with that. But when you go initially like that, as, 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 a, as a professional contract, it's very much pertinent to soccer players in Donegal because I think what, what happens maybe as a young fellow, as a lot of these young boys get homesick, maybe the, the, maybe the planning and the preparation, maybe there's a little thing missing. Just awareness of that first stage. The second stage, which is very pertinent to myself, was injuries. Um, I had cuts throughout my career. I've actually had 39 stitches in my face uh, with boxing. So it, it's a, it interrupts your career. It can lead to anxiety and, and, and doubts about your career. It can lead to all sorts of problems. Um, I had a busted hand halfway through my career, which really interrupted my career very bad because due to financial worries and, and mortgage and payments, you, I, had to, I had to take fights with, maybe, with no sparring and no pad work because of a busted hand. Injuries play a big part, but apparently with education and support and, and from the coaches and from the people around the young athlete that you can educate and you can actually make the, this sort of stage, the life-changing life stage in a young person's career, a lot more uh, fluent. The third stage that I think is very pertinent to a sports, young sports person in the planning is the end of career and retirement. To me it was massive because it basically left me in limbo. Um, no education. Um, I thought it was too good to work here. I thought it was too good to work there. And basically uh, I felt I was, I was in limbo land. I had, I had nowhere to turn to. And again, I had a few pounds made in boxing, but not enough to look at a few years down the road and mortgage and, and kids to go to school. So th throughout, throughout them three stages, it's very important as us as coaches and the people involved in clubs, there's a preparation there, even if it's a scholarship, it, it doesn't matter. But I just felt that them three stages were personal to me. And uh, coming back to Ireland with no job, no no qualifications, uh, nothing to fall back on. Um, it, it, it can lead to mental health problems. You can be anxious, you can be irritable at home, you can, you can be depressed. Because maybe the thing isn't planned proper. With an end of a career, if, 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 you, if you can plan and, and put the steps in place, that you can be educated while you're still in your career. But, and it makes the, the transition very much easier. Retirement. Retirement is, is a major. Uh, it can. It's a major traumatic thing with a lot of sports people. There's been unt untold, and uh, uh, there's plenty of documented uh, think, uh, articles in the paper about sports people who gamble, who drink, who financial problems, who come back to the sport because of financial problems and due to maybe lack of education around retirement. So I think as coaches, I know it's looking at the professional side of it, but. Donegal has that, has that much talent between our boxers in the county, our athletics, and then our cycling stars. We, we have, they're, they're all looking down that road, professional, the professional pathway. And I think, to me, it's important that we, we sort of set them up. So basically, after coming back from, from London, no job, nowhere to go. I was very, very grateful and... and, and for the adult education system that allowed me to study mental health nursing. And uh, through those three years, uh, with, with, with good lectures and, and good, good nurses on the board, I, 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 I qualified as a nurse in 2002. And during that time, sport and exercise played, played a big part in, in my life. Sport to me, is, exercise to me, is very much, it's very much about... Uh, a distraction is very much about de-stressing. Exercise to me is everything. It's, it's just a way of uh, go for a run in the morning, come back and you have a full day ahead of full of energy and you, I just feel some, sometimes I can think of the world. Well, during, that, during that time, studying wasn't easy, but I often felt with family support and, and, and believe it or not, with my exercise and involvement in sport, sort of carried me through that time. Where I'm at now, 
I'm involved now at the minute with training groups, and again I want to focus on support and exercise at, at this stage. We've done four years of uh, charity boxing, and we've changed people's lives uh, through a six-week training program. And basically, through a charitable boxing, we have raised €111,000 to date for uh, various charities throughout the four years. Again, we're, it was just exercise. It's, 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 it's boxing, but again, people enjoy it. We have had questionnaires before the, before the actual boxing event took place, and we've quite, we give them questionnaires when it finishes. And we've had people, we have one guy, he's with us a year, and he's lost, he's lost five and a half stone. We have somebody come down from 36 waist to 34. You know, we've had people, somebody's in the audience there, Siobhan. Siobhan had never run before with us, and she's run marathons and done plenty of many marathons. We've changed people's life with, with, with exercise. Um, for the really a life campaign, camp, campaign, we had a, had a group of people, 45 people, and we trained once a day for, for six weeks. Ordinary people from various ages, from, from late 30s, 40 to 50, again making a difference in people's lives. And there's always positive feedback from exercise and, 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 and taking part. We've climbed Errigal, we've climbed Muggish, we've done 22k in Glen Vey, we've walked up Loch Salt every Sunday as part of that six week training plan, plus we, we train twice a week and plus we went for runs in the morning. Ordinary people from all walks of life and a lot of them aren't, aren't involved in any sport. I think as coaches we play an important role, maybe not always with the elite athlete, but sometimes the less talented athlete I think it needs our support too. Um, recently I was at, it was actually a couple of years ago, I was at a, a ground, a ground, I'm not sure what sport, and a young fella came up to the coach, and he was a heavy, strong wee young fella, and he says, you know, I'd like to take part, but to be fair to the coach, he, it, there was a, a big event coming for his team. And he said to the young fella, no, you'll have to come back next season because I'm busy here with us and we're not starting proper to into next season again. And I thought to myself, when that young fella turned away and he walked away, and I said, God, this is, it took a lot for that young fella to come to, to approach the coach here today. And he's actually gone and, and will he come back? But I wasn't involved in the sport. I was just there with, 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 a, with another. But I think as coaches, we have to look sometimes at the the lesser talented people. Um, again, in clubs it's hard because the coaches, there's little coaches you'll find in a lot of clubs and, and have, a lot of, have a lot on their plate. With my work at the minute, um, recently I had a 66 year old man feeling down, feeling not much happening in his life. He, he came up to the class and I says, whatever you want to do, just do. He came into the class and he'd he done the battling ropes, we call them. He'd he done the punch the bags and he trained and he came phoned me up the next day and he says, you know what, he said, That's, that was just great. And what he has done since, he's actually bought a bicycle and he told, he told me he's done two cycles and he's bicycle and he hasn't been on a bike in 45 years. So exercise and sport, and sport that can, can do amazing things for people. I'd just like to I suppose basically nearly finished now, but uh, with positive, positive mental health, um, it, it begins in, in, in adolescent and it, 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 there's adulthood, but there's also elderly people who all can benefit from exercise. And with mental health, it's an evolving process. It's, we always have to keep it in touch. Sport and exercise is like that. You must keep, keep yourself active, keep the weight down. Think simple. It's, if it, it's a walk, it's a walk. But our, mentally, our mental health is equally as important. And uh, I'll just finish that quote. Uh, it's not even a quote, it's just something I sort of made up myself. Um, mental health starts in child, childhood, adolescence, adult, elderly, and it's ever evolving. And like exercise, it never stops. Thank you. Thank you.
Well, as Jim McGuinness just said about Danny, that last is a cog now. So well done, Danny. Thanks for that. So look, we've almost come to the end. Um, thanks for launching that, Danny, and thanks for those great inspirational words. Very brief words. The county manager from Donegal County Council, and they're very much part of this with Mayor Breert McBrearty. Seamus Needy is going to say a few closing words. Seamus. I think what can I say, today has been a fabulous day, it's been a fabulous uh, occasion, very special occasion, and indeed the audience that has come here today has been a very engaged audience, and one that has participated very much so and has made today the success that it absolutely and undoubtedly is. Um, I suppose I know that, for, that, that the Mayor uh, will be thanking everyone concerned, but I just want to take the opportunity to acknowledge the efforts of everyone today, those that have organised it, those that have uh, helped in any way, and, and certainly those that have made it happen, and, and in particular all of the contributors today have been fabulous. Um, I suppose if we just think, and, and I suppose if the day were longer, you could spend ages talking about the learning that each of us might have got from today, and certainly I, I got a lot of learning from today. And, and you know, when you see how the discussion ranged from the, from the morning right through to the evening, I suppose that very interesting discussion about the interface of emotion and rational reasoning, and indeed, as as um, others have spoken about, when emotion is raised and, and how, how powerful that can be, and I suppose to understand that. I suppose another thing that was said that was very striking to me earlier was that it's okay not to be okay. And I wondered then about, well, what is okay and where do you fix that? And I suppose in my own mind what I finished up is that wherever anyone is and whatever stage they're in for themselves, that's okay. And that's someone that we need to, to, to work with. Dr. Shargi talked about the opportunity that now exists in a cloud. And that is that the economic crisis is that there has enabled discussions like this to happen and to happen in a very open way and in a very enabling way. And again, I think that's something that we need to think about and learn from and see how we can, how we can take it on uh, to, to the next, very much to the next stage. Um, again, some of the key things said by contributors like genuine relationships, um, to have a perspective, to think about the context in which someone has been said, and in particular, the context that someone is coming from when they're making a contribution or doing their best. And again, others talked about turning experience into strength. Whatever that experience might be, whether it was an experience that they encountered as a consequence of a negative happening or a positive happening or otherwise, I think it's about trying to learn how you turn that into a strength. And certainly from today and from the thinking that we've done here today and from what the advice that we've got from up here today, we are better placed to turn experiences that we've had into strengths. I suppose looking at it, I was just thinking about it, what, what I might say earlier, and I was going to say that today was very stimulating, and I've said that, very energizing, very enabling, and very motivating. And I wondered then, you know, well, how is it motivating for, for me, for instance? And, and um, I realized that we all come to today, uh, we're on our own individual journeys. They have happened up to now. They will happen after today. But yet, some of the things that were said, and thinking back to some of the things that Jim talked about in particular, because it's most recent in my mind, about achieving potential. And, and you know, it's great to be able to say that I've achieved 50, 55 percent, because that's a great understanding. But when you put that in the context of what has been achieved, you then really get an appreciation of what can be. So again, that, that's, that's motivating in its own way. And, and you know, some people, when you ask, have you reached your potential? I think everyone has occasionally reached their potential. But it's, I suppose, turning those occasion, occasions into a larger part of your life rather than an occasional part of your life. The mayor talked earlier about the purpose of today. You know, he talked about um, how he wanted uh, today to be about getting a message of, out uh, about um, showcasing what's good uh, and our experiences. And I suppose then to look in particular at how sport plays a very strong part in that. Um, so again. I'm certainly motivated from what I've heard today, and, and I've, I've, I take things away from today that, that I will certainly think about and how I might 
uh, use it in, in, in times to come in, in, in a positive way. The other thing, and the last thought I, that, that, I, that I leave this with is that I think today um, made me think about the difference between people as individuals and their own personal existence and people in role. And um, certainly um, the closer that we can get a person in role to being the individual, then we, we will get better outcomes from that. And I think there's something to be learned about, about that as well. And certainly that's, that's something that, that, that I will think about beyond today. Um, the whole area of self-confidence and experience and how one interacts with the other. Um, Jim again talked about the interface between focus, perspective, and potential. Um, I suppose I would say that, and I want to acknowledge that there was very personal stories told today, but told to very good effect. Um, we talked about being proud to be uh, from Donegal and living in Donegal, and I think that's something that's, um, that's very strong today. But to be fair, I think we're, we're also very proud of being in Donegal today, irrespective of where we've come from, because that happens to be what's going on right now, and we're here, and we've been part of a, of a very good conversation. And I think it's, it's getting something from that and taking it on. Um, I said earlier, we're on individual journeys, some done, some to go. We have collective journeys, um, and we have parts of our journey ahead where our collective journeys will interface with each other. And I think that's some of, some of what we need to take forward today and carry some of these initiatives on from something that is beyond just talking about it today, but actually taking it in and, and putting it into practice. And certainly there will be relationships formed of the, as a consequence of this conference and this event, which has been empowering and very, very, very successful. And I uh, look forward to working with all of the players and capturing as much of that <clears throat> and putting it into some form of an outcome that will make our collective and our interface journey a better one and a better one for all. My, my last word is, and I want to take the opportunity to, um, I suppose, they acknowledge the very, very strong drive that Frank McBerty, the individual, has brought to this initiative, and indeed that Frank McBerty, Councillor Frank McBerty, the Mayor of Donegal, has brought to this initiative. And as a, as a leader put him to go back down, I would want you to put your hands together to acknowledge what he has done for that. And I think it's very appropriate to do that because he has certainly done this for the right reason and has gone about it in a very wholehearted and open way. Thank you and good evening. And on that note, the man of the moment, let me introduce you for the final few words, Mayor Frank McBerty. Well, first of all, um, we're coming to the end now, so everyone's tired, and I think the good feel factor is still here today, but... Uh, I just want to acknowledge the county manager. Um, we've heard a lot of different words here today and support. I think it's one of the most important words that was here. There's many good words that have been said, but I want to acknowledge the county manager and the team in Donegal County Council um, <coughs> because I have had their support over the term as mayor, and I want to uh, thank them for all the support they have given me. Um, and I think that uh, the deputy mayor... Uh, Martin Farn is sitting down there as well. Um, I've had a great support network and I've been able to do a lot of things in a year uh, as mayor and I want to thank them and I want to give, ask everybody would they give them a round of applause. <laughs> I also want to take this opportunity to thank some people. Um, I want to thank Reynolds of Rafaux who have done the lighting and the sound and the stage here. Um, Thanks very much. Uh, I think they've done a fantastic job. I um, also want to thank uh, Kevin McHugh. Um, everyone knows Kevin, but, but people don't. maybe some people in here don't know. Kevin's a sports star in his own right. He's played for Van Harps for many years. He played for Derry City. He played for Linfield. And he was across the water when he was a young fella. And you would have heard Danny Ryan about professional sport. So Kevin works in the IT section of the council. Um, uh, the technical work on the webcast on that and I just want to thank Kevin for being here and I also want to thank Dara McDonough 
from the council from the, for, for, for the webcast as well. So if you give a round of applause. For I also want to thank uh, Barry and Margaret Jackson and all the staff here in Jackson's Hotel. It's a fantastic venue. Um, and I also would uh, like to thank them for all their help and cooperation. I also want to thank the HSE, uh, the National Lottery, the Irish Public uh, Body, uh, and Donegal County Council for all the funding for this event. Because without the funding, I wouldn't be able to put this together. Um, the working group, I want to pay tribute to them, the, the 20 people that were on the working, interagency working group. I can't name them all because there's 20 of them, but what do you call it? Without them, I wouldn't have been able to put this conference together, and I want to sincerely thank them. Um, also, uh, as well, uh, all the guest speakers. Um, the guest speakers, I think, what they've contributed here today has started a national conversation about mental, mental health, and I think that the word today leaving this conference is that through sport, we can promote positive mental health. And I just want to thank them for their contributions. Um, and I also want to thank Jim McGuinness personally as well for being the ambassador for this event. I think that um, he's got a very busy schedule. I tortured him till I got him. Um, <laughs> and I did get him, so what do you call it? Um, so to all the guest speakers, uh, I want to would you just give them all a round of applause. Social media is very important, and I want to pay a special thank you to Laura Coyle, who is an intern on Donegal County Council at the minute. And she, she has worked on the Facebook and Twitter. Uh, people will see Sam up on the County Council webpage, um, and I want to thank her very much, because that's the way forward, I feel, the multimedia. Um, I also want to take this opportunity to thank the media in Donegal. I think that they've been fantastic. They have came behind the project. They have given it the boost that it needed. Um, they have talked about it for weeks and weeks uh, leading up to today. And I would like to thank them from the bottom of my heart for all the help that they have given us. And I think, too, I want to say the Sean Doherty show after I spoke about my own problems, um, I want to thank Sean Doherty personally because I think it took it to another level when I shared my story on the Sean Doherty show on Highland Radio a number of months ago. So I would like to thank Highland Radio for that and all the local media. Um, at this stage, um, I'm going to make a few presentations, um, but I want to say this. Um, bringing somebody like Maria McKellan here brings a different perspective to a conference because it gives it a national profile, and the guest speakers here today uh, have shown that, but especially somebody of the, the, the quality of Mary McKellan. We watch her every night on uh, Praying time on a Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday, and I think that the what do you call it? Uh, the fact that the John Murray show was broadcast live here today. I want to thank Miriam uh, for her contribution here today, and I also I'm going to make a presentation to Miriam. But I'm, it's a it's a Donegal prayer, and I want to I want to give you this I want to give you this prayer because I want you to remember Donegal okay. forevermore. <laughs> but, but, but before I give you the, the, the prayer, I'm going to read it out. Okay. So, and the prayer goes as follows. I think it's appropriate for today. May you rise each day aware of the sacred gift of life. May you open your eyes each morning to the miracle that is yourself. May your heart know the love that every moment surrounds you. May you accept with open hands the daily gifts of hope, of wonder, of grace and of presence. May you hold in your memory the beauty of Mount Erigal and the mountains of Los Wally and the coastline of the rivers, lakes and islands and above all the people of County Donegal until once more you stand amongst us. Written by F uh, Fenton Gogarty. Uh, I think it's appropriate for today to finish that off. Thank you, Frank. Very, 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 very,
I also want to take this opportunity uh, to thank Clive Wazen. I think he's done a fantastic job. And I know that Clive will put out the photographs and hopefully the national media will, will catch on to them and show what we have done here today. And the fact that we've had so much go on here today is unbelievable. But I have a number of other people that I want to make a few presentations to. And I want to acknowledge, there's five people in total that I want to acknowledge. Darren sadly is not here, he had to go away. Um, Darren Nash, um, we all know the little logo, Sam. As you heard me say to the Minister earlier, that I wanted to take it back to Dublin and tell them in government that we want this logo put right around the country. Um, there's four girls that have worked here today, but have worked tirelessly for the last year helping me put this together. And I want to acknowledge the four of them. Uh, Kate Coughlin, uh, Christina O'Donnell, Caroline McCleary and Anne-Marie Conlon. Because I have to say this, without the four of them, this wouldn't have been possible today. And I want to make a presentation to each one of them. So, so at this stage, I would ask Kate Coughlin to come up first. Um, I'm going to give them a bouquet of flowers each uh, for the, the work that they have done for me. Um, well, thank you. Um, can I have Christina O'Donnell? McCleary. sitting down there, and my sister Maria, who's here, uh, my sister-in-law Jackie. Um, I want to pay a tribute to them because it was hard for them to hear some of the things that were said here today because it brings back memories. And me talking about my own problems, um, it's hard for them. And I just want to thank them for being here, uh, supporting me, uh, helping me get through my own problems. But finally, I just want to say, when I first started this process, I was asked by the working group, what did I want to achieve? And I told them what I wanted to achieve out of this conference was that at the very end of it, that everyone here uh, would know that there's someone that you can talk to. Um, and if one person here today has got something out of, this, out of this conference, then I have achieved my goal. And I just want to thank everyone from the bottom of my heart uh, for participating uh, uh, with us today, and I want to say this, I want to thank the audience for the participation here today, because without you, we couldn't have done it. Thank you. Thank you very much.